All right, testing there. Okay, sorry, uh, we got started a little late. We wanted to people, give people time to trickle in. Uh, I'm gonna keep this short and sweet because we have a lot of information to give you. Um, the city of Bloomington is happy to start this process with Tool Design. We have a great group from Tool Design. They'll introduce themselves shortly. Um, but uh, we have an alarming number of fatalities and serious uh, injuries on our roadways, and we would like to completely eliminate those. So uh, the presentation you're about to witness uh, will talk about our path forward, and uh, yeah, we'll have so uh, some good discussion about it, hopefully. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having us. My name is Dean Chamberlain. I'm the project manager for Tool Design Group for this project. We're really happy to be with you all today to talk about uh, the Safe Streets and Roads for All program for the city of Bloomington. Uh, so here's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, first of all, we're going to give uh, introductions of ourselves, and then also we want to hear uh, who you all are in the room as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Give an over, uh, overview of uh, where we're at, you know, sitting here tonight as part of our safety week uh, engagement extravaganza, we'll say. Uh, and uh, we'll also go through uh, some initial results of our safety analysis for the City of Bloomington's transportation facilities. Uh, give an overview also of what Vision Zero is and then uh, open it up for plenty of time for discussion. Uh, Ask the, ask the staff that are here if you have any questions about what this is, what uh, some of the data is telling us, and where do we go from here. So, and then uh, finally wrapping up with logistics and next steps. So uh, I introduced myself, Dean Chamberlain, uh, with Tool Design Group, and um, I'm gonna start with the project team here. Hey everybody, I'm Drew Parker with Tool Design, the deputy project manager. That's How about the audience? <laughs> Just your name and if, what uh, commission or organization you're a part of. Yeah, I'm definitely part of this commission. Great. I'm Jack Gray, I'm commission. Bill No? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no worries, that's okay. <laughs> all right. We're gonna kind of take team this presentation here so you don't have to listen to me talk all night. So, Drew, go right ahead. Sure. <coughs> yeah, thanks again for coming, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so this is just gonna give you a little bit of a project overview. And so this shows you kind of what the schedule is for the project and all the tasks that we're gonna be working on. So in the red, you can see all the things that we're doing as a project team. Um, so we have started with developing a vision and goals. We'll show you what that vision is towards the end of this presentation. Um, we have an equity framework that was developed as part of this project to ensure as throughout the process, as we do engagement and we look at recommendations and essentially everything that we do um, as part of the project has a focus on improving equity. So that's something we did earlier in the project. What we're really gonna present on right now is the safety analysis. Um, a lot of the crash analysis and the high injury network, the draft high injury network that we've developed, so that's a lot of what you'll see today. In the future, after this safety week, what we're gonna be working on is developing a final action plan that says what we're gonna do in, this, in the community of Bloomington, um, as, as Ryan said, to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries. So part of that is gonna be looking at policy and process changes, as well as identifying strategies and, and projects to help us do that. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a steering committee. This is, this is the joint committee. We're also gonna have a steering committee later this week. That committee has already met twice, back in October and then in February, and then we're gonna meet with them this week um, on Thursday, and then one more time in May or June. And they've kind of just been taking a look at, at draft materials and providing us feedback on things. 
So in addition to that, public engagement, we have an online survey that's been out for a little while now. Some of you may have seen it. Um, if not, check out the project website. You can take a look at that survey, drop pins, uh, and provide feedback. There's a, there's a nice survey in there. Then really the heart of the engagement is this week, Safety Week. So we'll be doing all sorts of events, and Sarah's gonna present on a slide on that in a little bit that explains what that is. And then also um, through the summer, we'll be doing some e-blasts and social media and kind of just keeping people updated on the, the project and the process. So I'm gonna give a little bit of a presentation on Safe Streets and Roads for All, what it is and how it's, basically, how it's the basis for this project. Um, so there's gonna be a few slides on this coming up and then we'll uh, talk about a couple of different things here. So Safe Streets and Roads for All is a grant program the, that the United States Department of Transportation put out as part of um, President Biden's bipartisan inf infrastructure law. And the U USDOT had a national roadway safety strategy and the USDOT, so our entire country has a goal uh, of zero roadway deaths, but this grant program really put some money in front of that. Um, so $5 billion was allocated to that program from 2022 to 2026, and the applications are on an annual cycle. Um, as part of that, there's two different pots of money. There's the planning and demonstration grants. So that funds, generally speaking, the, the creation of action plans like what we're doing here. It also um, funds demonstration projects. So going and putting something out in the community, uh, seeing how it does, some sort of um, counter, safety countermeasure and seeing how it does and evaluating it. Uh, and then the other side of that where there's a really big portion of the pot of money that's available is in implementation grants. And so these grants um, are on the order of millions to tens of millions of dollars for communities to get construction projects in the ground to reconstruct their streets and make them safer. So there's a lot of money available. Um, and a lot, a lot of communities have already won those grants, but uh, a prerequisite to getting those implementation grants is you have to have an action plan published. So that's a, a big part of what we're doing here is putting together this action plan so then eventually we can apply for an implementation grant. So there's eight components that have to be part of a Safer Streets and Roads for All action plan, and we have all these covered within our process, but I just wanted you to see those up here. So there has to be leadership commitment, so typically the mayor has to commit to saying, this is the goal year when we are going to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries. You also have to have a planning structure where there's a project team and there's a steering committee that's guiding the project, so we have that covered with our project steering committee. You have to do robust safety analysis, engagement and collaboration with the public, equity considerations, and then um, the other things I mentioned earlier in our process, the policy and process changes, strategy and project selection, and then progress and transparency is really about publicly reporting out on what you're doing once you publish the plan and having, essentially having a plan for how are you gonna track progress. Typically that's a website where you do annual reports. So why did the USDOT make this, this program? Well, really, the way we like to think of it at Tool Design is that traffic fatalities are a public health crisis that's affecting all roadway users. Um, as, as of uh, 2021, 1.3, sorry, in the year 2021, 1.3 million people globally lost their lives in traffic crashes. And in the US in 2022, that number was almost 43,000 people. And then coupled with that, we've also seen a pretty drastic increase in pedestrians being struck and killed across the United States and some communities more drastically than others, but uh, commonly across all communities in the United States, we've seen that trend. And part of this is due to speeds. Typically, Vision Zero efforts focus on reducing speeds um, so that if there is a crash, the likelihood of fatality or severe injury is low. So you can see this graphic shows three different speeds at 20 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, and 40 miles an hour, what the percentage likelihood of a fatality or severe injury is for someone walking if they're struck by a person driving a car. So at 20 miles an hour, the likelihood is pretty low at 13%, or about one in 10, but it gets higher as speed increases. It just makes sense, there's more kinetic energy. So at 30%, at 30 miles an hour, it's 40%, and up at 40 miles an hour, it's 73%. And this is a problem because a lot of our arteri arterial streets are streets where people travel 40 miles an hour and we have a lot of pedestrians crossing. So that's something we'll want to think about. Um, I don't have that graphic specifically, but yeah, absolutely. It, it's significantly higher fatality risk for old, older and younger populations than, 
median age. Yeah, absolutely. So part of um, the USDOT's recommendation, what a lot of communities are moving to, is the safe system approach. And the safe system approach is very different than traditional traffic safety planning and engineering. Um, the safe system pro systems approach is more looking at a holistic way of evaluating safety in your community, and it places safety first and foremost. So we really, anytime we think about any decision or investment, we're thinking about safety first. And it's not just the tagline safety first, it really is incorporating that into every aspect of what we do first before we think about anything else. Um, so this graphic on the right is something that FHWA created, the Federal Highway Administration, that um, talks about the five different elements to the safe system approach. So you have safe road users, safe vehicles, safe speeds, safe roads, and post-crash care. And the way we like to talk about it is you have to have all these slices of pie for this wheel for this wheel to roll. So you really need to think about all five of these things. You can't just focus on safe road users, you know, people improving their behavior. You can't just focus on safer vehicles. Our vehicles have gotten significantly more safer for occupants, but not for people outside vehicles, obviously. So um, this slide talks about the difference between the traditional approach and the safe system approach. So the traditional approach to traffic safety engineering says we should just prevent crashes. That should be the ultimate goal. But the safe system approach says we're not going to eliminate all crashes, but we do want to prevent death and serious injuries if a crash does occur. So we're really focused on those fatal and serious injury crashes. So you'll see that a lot throughout the presentation tonight. The traditional approach, and you'll see this a lot in a lot of different places, talks about improving human behavior and talking about fault and crashes. Who, who was at fault? What were they doing? That's the, the first thing that people think about. Well, whose fault was it there was a crash? Well, the safe system approach says we don't really care. We just should design a system knowing that humans are going to make mistakes and people are flawed and they make mistakes. But if they do make a mistake, it shouldn't be fatal. The traditional approach also says we need to control speeding. Um, whereas the safe system approach says we should reduce system kinetic energy. And that one's kind of confusing, but the point of that is we can't easily control speeding per se without putting speed limiters on vehicles, but we can reduce system kinetic energy, which means um, we can use things like impact attenuators like you see on the highway so that if someone is traveling fast they, and they hit something, it slows them down and reduces the kinetic energy before an impact occurs. So that's kind of an example of that one. That one's a little bit more confusing, but the overall idea is that we're building a system that's forgiving, our transportation system. Um, the traditional approach also, similar to improving human behavior, has always said individuals are responsible for crashes. But the safe system approach says this is a shared responsibility. It's something that we all have a stake in. We all need to act to improve. The traditional approach also has said we should react based on crash history. We should just look at the places that have the most crashes and, and focus on those. The safe system approach says that's important. We should look at crash analysis, but we should also proactively identify and address risks. So just because there's crashes one place and there's not crashes in another place doesn't mean tomorrow a crash can't occur there because the street is designed in a way that's unsafe. Um, the next slide here, this talks about redundancy. So those five different elements that you saw on the wheel chart, the, uh, we like to talk about it like a Swiss cheese model of redundancy that if you can focus on all five of these, one of these five elements might go wrong during a crash event, but it's unlikely that all five will go wrong at the same time, um, which is the only way that a death or serious injury will occur is if, if you fail at all five of these things at exactly the same time. And so if we just focus on one of these things, then it's kind of piecemeal and we're not really looking at the whole system-wide approach. Okay, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah to talk about what's going on this week in particular. Okay, good evening, everybody. So as Drew talked about, um, there's, we've done various forms of engagement throughout the project and there will be some more in the future, but. We know from doing transportation plans all over the country and locally that you know it's one thing to ask people to come to you to, to, to tell you to, so they can tell you what they think, but it's a whole other thing if you're out in the community um, kind of just intercepting people where they are. And so that is our main strategy for this plan is we are basically doing an engagement blitz this week. 
Um, we're gonna be all over the city in all sorts of places. We had to do some um, last minute updates today because there's thunderstorms all day tomorrow, so we didn't wanna be standing outside with all day and didn't want people to think they had to stand outside with us. Um, so our main strategy for engagement week is pop-up events. And pop-up events are really kind of a, a packet of events um, that we can just pop up at any location. So it's a quick, simple activity. We're really only expecting folks to hang out for three to five minutes. Um, and so it's a, it's a quick engagement activity. And the survey questions that we'll be asking and the activities that we're doing are really the same sorts of questions as we're asking on the online maps. And so we're looking to complement that data that we've also already gotten online with information that we're getting in person. Also, when we were thinking about where to do the engagement events throughout the city, we were very conscious of wanting to make sure that we were getting different age groups, demographics, race and ethnicity, languages. So we really wanted to get a broad spectrum of Bloomington residents. So here is our schedule. Um, so we are gonna be, we're gonna be all over the place. Um, so if you happen to be by any of these places over the course of the week, you will see us. Um, the main ones that I wanted to bring up um, are the three evening events. So we have one tomorrow, um, which is a Taco Tuesday event. It was supposed to be in a park and there was gonna be taco trucks, it was gonna be great. Um, but instead, it's still gonna be great. Instead, it's going to be here at City Hall, um, and you'll get a coupon for a free taco at the taco truck um, because, you know, they don't allow taco trucks inside. Um, but that'll be happening Tuesday night. Then Wednesday night, we're going to be at the Chocolate Moose, um, giving away free ice cream for folks that participate in our activities. And then on Thursday, um, we're going to be at Friendly Beast for their trivia night um, doing our engagement events. So those evening events are going to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more intense as far as the engagement. We have about eight stations that we'll be setting up for folks, versus the little pop-ups, um, which are really one station. So we're asking people to do more and tell us more at those evening events. You'll also see in the engagement week we're going to be hitting up a couple schools this week. So we're going to be talking um, with fourth and sixth graders at Fairview Elementary tomorrow. We're going to be talking with K through third graders on Wednesday at the Project School, and then we're going to be at Tri North Middle School um, watching the psychology of junior high students, which is amazing. Um, so we're hitting up some schools, and then we have a couple more formal presentations, one here tonight with you all um, at the multi-commission meeting. Then we'll be at City Council on Wednesday. Um, the steering committee that Drew previously talked about is on Thursday morning, and then we have a walking tour on Friday morning that will be for council members and steering committee members to really get them out, seeing what we're talking about, and having those discussions kind of in live time. So that's what we're up to. Um, I hope that you'll pick one of these evening events. Um, I hope one of them is up your alley and you can come and join us. They're totally free and we actually give you stuff as part of it. Um, but if you happen to be popping by any of these other locations or have friends or family that are regularly in these places, tell them to keep an eye out for us. Okay, so with that, I'll turn back over to Dean. All right, thanks, Sarah. So uh, send up the uh, nerdy engineer to talk about data, yay. Hope everybody else is excited about that too. Uh, so yeah, at least somebody is, thank you. <laughs> so um, uh, the past couple months, we've been um, crunching the numbers, so to speak, on uh, you know crash analysis, uh, kind of looking into the past uh, as to where, you know, what is our, baseline scenario here, what are, we, what are we working with? So in the past five years of data, so when we started this analysis, 2023 wasn't complete, so the last five years that are complete data, 2018 to 2022, uh, the city of Bloomington had over 13,000 crashes uh, of all various shapes and sizes, so to speak. Uh, there were 14 fatal crashes in the city of Bloomington during that five-year period and 742 serious injury crashes, which is a lot. Uh, and you'll see kind of some comparison uh, to other communities later on here too. So adding the other fatal and serious injury crashes, we have about 756 uh, 
uh, reported fatal and serious injury crashes over that five year period. And fatal and serious injury crashes are kind of the ones that we're looking for. Like Drew was saying, we're not looking at all 13,000 crashes that are happening in the city of Bloomington, really trying to focus our efforts on the ones that are it really impacting people's health and livelihood, so to speak. Uh, and so this is kind of what it breaks down year by year in that five year period. Um, the blue line is the kind of the injury crashes, uh, and then the red line are the fatal crashes over that five year period. Um, we'll kind of get into the trends here in a bit too, but uh, yeah, over 100 uh, injury, serious injury crashes per year in the city of Bloomington, which is, which is a lot. Um, so we're looking at it by mode, which is essentially like who's involved in the crash. Is this a vehicle? Is it somebody walking, biking, taking a scooter or a mobility device? Uh, and severity, you know, uh, we're looking at a lot, of, a lot of the total crashes are vehicle crashes because it seems to make sense, right? A lot of people get around town by driving, right? Uh, however, when we look at, you know, incapacitating injury crashes, those who are walking, biking, or have a mobility device are overrepresented in, in the fatal and serious injury crash, uh, those numbers. So, and that makes sense too. If you're in a vehicle, you kind of have a built-in safety thing around you so that you know, you're know more protected from harm. But you know, somebody who's walking, biking doesn't have that. And they're, you know, like you're saying, kinetic energy. The laws of physics apply. So um, if there is a crash that involves somebody walking or biking, there's a higher chance that that's gonna end up not well for the person who is walking or biking. Uh, so this is kind of looking at uh, a little bit more graphically, like uh, you know, uh, motor vehicle only crashes. Yeah, 95 percent, uh, about 5 percent then uh, involve a fatal or serious injury. When we talk about pedestrian-involved crashes, um, you know that that number of fatal and serious injury uh, goes up to almost 30 percent. Bicycle-involved crashes about 20, 21, 22 percent. And scooter-involved crashes is about 27 percent. So that's uh, that's a lot. Uh, by hour of day, uh, it you know seems to make sense that more crashes are happening when more people are out and about, which is usually the afternoon. Uh, so we see kind of a spike of crashes happening uh, more or less around that four o'clock afternoon rush hour, so to speak. Um, but we also see still a fair amount of them happening. Uh, at times of day that there aren't as many, you know, people out and about, and um, you know, we'll kind of look at that too. We do see that uh, motor vehicle crashes; a lot of them are happening in the daylight conditions, but there are some that are happening uh, when it's dark out, either in lighted areas or areas that are not lighted. Um, that darkness number, we'll say, goes way up for people who are walking, and that kind of makes sense. That if you can't see, you know between either the person walking or the person driving if they can't see each other, uh, especially people walking, um, that turns out not, not good. Uh, and similarly, uh, the bicyclist ones, I'm kind of, I was interested to see that there weren't as many uh, dark uh, uh, related crashes for bicyclists, but definitely for people who are walking, that is a big problem. Uh, so we've kind of, digest all the numbers, so to speak, and um, we try to turn that into something that's like spatial. So like how, not every street in town has as many crashes on it, that makes sense. We don't see, you know, crashes distributed all over town. They're often, you know, focused on certain corridors, uh, which I think for anybody who travels said corridors is intuitive, makes sense, right? Uh, so uh, what we uh, call that is a high injury network. And so that is, again, looking at the, the corridors of transportation that are historically, you know, in the last five years that we've been looking at seeing higher numbers of crashes. So we can bring up the maps. All right. So this is the high injury network for the city of Bloomington for all modes of traffic. So combining everybody together. I'll get into separating them out in just a second, but a few observations I'll say. Uh, there's, there's a lot of the high injury network that is focused around the downtown area. Um, 
I think there, you know there's a lot of people around, uh, especially a lot of people walking and biking. You know, very busy multimodal activity going on. Makes sense. Um, and some of these other streets that pop up, uh, like the bypass around town. Uh, you know, kind of third street that turns into the state highway heading east out of town, heading west out of town, heading southwest out of town. Uh, those kind of arterial streets, we'll say, the, the busier streets uh, tend to, to show up with high injury network. That's very, very common in other places we've done this as well. But uh, the wider streets, streets that people are traveling faster uh, tend to show up, and that's, what's, that that's what we're seeing here as well. Uh, looking up. The motor vehicle crashes, so you know, kind of, kind of more or less matches the map that I showed before. Definitely a lot downtown, and then kind of on the arterial streets around the, the city area. But when you look at uh, these maps for people who are walking, biking, it, there's certain corridors that show up a little bit more, especially around like IU campus. Uh, there's a lot, a lot more prevalence of people who are. Um, uh, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot more streets uh, that show up on, as being of concern uh, to people walking, crossing the street, that kind of thing. Uh, for bicyclists, uh, we see kind of a similar thing where there's a, a lot of streets kind of surrounding the IU campus, uh, some, other, some of those arterial streets as well. Um, and then there were a few kind of scooter mobility device crashes, uh, mostly around the IU campus again. So. Uh, Kind of combining all, all three of the walking, biking, taking scooters, uh, we have a vulnerable road user um, uh, map here as well. So this information is great for us to look at what's happened in the past, but we need to also pair that with a few other things to make sure that we have a holistic picture of what's going on. Uh, there are certain places that people do not walk because they do not want to get run over by a vehicle, right? Or or bike, or even avoid driving in those places because they feel unsafe. Uh, so one second here. We need to pair this high injury network, the high injury network, looking backwards, with a systemic safety analysis looking forwards. So we're kind of looking at like what are the trends that we're seeing from the past crash history, and are there other streets in town that aren't showing up on the map, but like are pretty similar in character uh, to those streets as well. So, you know, is that number of lanes, speed limit, traffic volume, that kind of thing. Uh, and then also adding to that, the public input that uh, Sarah was mentioning that we're collecting both through the online engagement, but also here in person as well, kind of marrying all three of these together to get a, what. Well, what spits out is what we call a high risk network. So that's, look, that's kind of piecing everything together so that we have a full comprehensive picture of safety uh, within the city of Bloomington. Drew. All right, thanks Dean. So um, <clears throat> what I'm gonna talk about here that we're kind of moving to the next chapter of this presentation is examples of Vision Zero goals and approaches in other communities. And then at the end, we'll get to what we're proposing as the goal for this plan. So uh, there are a number of communities that have already adopted Safer Streets and Roads for All plans, but more commonly Vision Zero plans. So people started creating Vision Zero plans in the United States probably in the late 2000s. Um, a lot started doing it in the 2010s as well. Um, the only other one in Indiana that c currently has a published Safer Streets and Roads for All Action Plan is the Indianapolis Metropolitan Planning Organization. So that's the organization that plans for the whole uh, Indianapolis region. So including you know, Carmel and Anderson, all, all the cities around outside of Indianapolis too. So when they published their plan in 2022, they said, we're gonna reduce fatal and serious crashes by 35% by 2040. So all, all the other ones I'm gonna show, their vision is zero. This, this one, their vision is not zero, but a slight reduction. So a reduction of one third by 2040. Minneapolis, um, they, I think actually they published their first vision zero plan a while back, but they have recently updated it in 2023. So the 2023 to 2025 plan says their goal is zero traffic deaths and, and zero severe injuries on city streets by 2027. So that's coming up pretty soon in, in three years. And their guiding principles are 
safety and human life come first. So that's similar to what we talked about with the safe system approach. Focusing on being data-driven, um, equity, and accountability. And you see a lot of those themes through Vision Zero plans, those four there. Madison, Wisconsin, their goal is to re reduce all traffic deaths and severe injuries on streets, on city streets to zero by 2035. And their guiding principles are safety, equity, data focus, and accountability, which is almost exactly the same as Minneapolis, if you notice. Ann Arbor published their plan in 2021, and they said no one dies or is seriously injured and crashes on Arbor streets. By 2025, we have all worked together to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries resulting from traffic crashes. And their values are safety, mobility, accessibility for all, healthy people in sustainable places, and regional connectivity. Their Vision Zero plan is a little bit different because it's also their comprehensive transportation plan. Chicago, as of the 2017 Vision Zero Action Plan, said they wanted to eliminate traffic fatalities and serious injuries in the city of Chicago by 2026, also coming up really quickly. And their main goals um, were to invest additional resources in communities that are most affected by severe traffic crashes. So that's, I would say that's the equity component. Um, to work to change behaviors and perceptions to build a citywide culture of safety. So a lot of times you hear about the education and culture change in Vision Zero plans. Goal three, pretty straightforward, just make streets safer for all users. And then goal four, encourage and implement policies, training, and technologies that create safer vehicles and professional drivers. Some of the bigger cities really focus on professional drivers and big vehicles because a lot of their crashes tend to be uh, more like commercial vehicles uh, and pretty grisly crashes. Um, the city of Detroit published their plan in 2022 and their goal is to eliminate traffic deaths and severe injuries by 2050. They have quite a few, I'll show you a chart at the end of this, they have quite a few fatal and serious injury crashes and that's why they picked a pretty far out horizon year. I'm not gonna go through all of their goals, but you can see a lot of these goals and themes are pretty similar across Vision Zero action plans. The city of Denver published their, their plan in 2017 and then did an update in 2022 and their goal has always been to eliminate um, traffic deaths by 2030. Okay, so this chart shows you a timeline of all of those different Vision Zero action plans and safer streets and roads for all plans and what all the different years are that they committed to, um, as well as how many fatal and serious injury crashes they had in the most recent year when they published that plan. So for instance, City of Ann Arbor had 26 fatal and serious injury crashes in 2018 when they published the plan and they said in seven years, by 2025, we want that number to be zero. So in Bloomington, as you saw from what um, Dean mentioned, the most recent year of data that we had in 2022, there was 115 fatal and serious injury crashes. So that can kind of help you place where Bloomington is amongst these peer communities. So you can see though, there's a pretty wide range of years that, that communities are committing to. I'll give you a second to look at that slide because I know there's a lot of data there. I'll just note, city of Madison, Wisconsin is the closest as far as number of annual fatal and serious injury crashes at, at 90, and they committed to 2035. I still see people reading it, so I'm gonna leave it up for a little bit longer before I go to the next slide. I know there's a lot of good data on there. Yeah, question? Yeah, so there's that little asterisk note at the bottom there. Indianapolis committed to a 35% reduction in fatalities and serious injuries. So, right, so that's sort of the, what I talked about before, like the traditional approach to traffic safety planning is say like, we're not gonna be able to do it. We just don't think it's possible. So we're gonna commit to a goal of reducing it by a third, which is what we think is realistic. But the reality is, and what the whole point of this is, loss of human life that we could have saved is not acceptable, right? I can tell you, I talked to the transportation director in the city of Ann Arbor and he doesn't think they're gonna meet the goal next year, but they are reducing crashes, but what he said is that it gets harder and harder. Like the first five years is the easy ones and it gets harder and harder and requires more and more investment as you keep going. So I think, so, so uh, for all, uh, not all these communities, but many of these communities, they'll do their annual report and they'll talk about progress they made and how they plan to course correct. So a, a lot of times 
the bigger communities generally do those annual reports that says how we're trending. And some in Denver in particular, they were trending, they were continuing to trend up and the problem was getting worse. And so they kind of, re, it's called refocusing Vision Zero. They, had, they said we need to significantly rethink how we allocate our city budget because we're failing essentially, like our department is failing. Right. Poorly, and I think there there's been a couple articles. There's like one article in New York Times that was passed around a lot in our industry, showing the difference between I think it was specifically New Zealand and Australia and a bunch of other OECD countries and the United States. And the trend line is up in the United States, whereas it's down in all those other similarly um, comparable countries. Yeah, those would all be included. Um, we don't have a way to extrapolate that from the data, but we assume it's a small enough portion and we have a big enough sample size that it's not significantly skewing the data. Is there another question? Did I miss a hand? Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know if Ryan, you want to take that question. Yeah, there is absolutely planning uh, coordination with the university uh, to the maximum extent possible. So it's not a great answer, but it's true. We talk to them all the time. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know, Ryan, if that's something that's maybe covered in the comprehensive transportation plan or how you want to incorporate transit in. Uh, yeah, so incorporating transit is something we're newly doing. Um, it's something we would like to do more. We're updating, I don't know if you're familiar, but we're planning to update the transportation plan in the near future uh, following this update. Um, and so uh, we've started early conversations with transit in order to consider uh, transit as a, a primary transportation focus uh, rather than a secondary one as it had been in the past. I'd say in general, in Vision Zero efforts, transit riders are typically seen as pedestrians in the data. So it's the you know, same user type because someone riding the bus is also a pedestrian when they get on and off the bus. Any other questions before I move to the next slide? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about setting a Vision Zero goal and then I'm going to present what our Vision Zero goal is. So the Vision Zero Network is a group of communities that puts together resources on how to develop a Vision Zero action plan. And so this is a slide that explains from their perspective how you should set a Vision Zero target year. And so the number one thing is to identify a reach zero year as a baseline. So that's kind of different than the, um, some, the at least the one example we had which didn't go to zero. The Vision Zero Network says you must say we're gonna reach zero by some time, otherwise what's the point? Um, Typically, cities will use a 10-year time frame as their baseline, and then as part of that, what you need to do is develop near-term and, and long-term goals for how you're gonna achieve that, and then annually measure it. So at Tool Design, the way we, we kind of interpret this and, and the way that we think about setting a vision zero target year is there's, there's three elements. Looking at the number of fatal and serious injury crashes within the last five to 10 years, that's what you saw Dean present, looking at that trend line then thinking about what are the action items, um, what's the timeline for those action items, and how soon do we expect those to result in behavior changes. 
The third pillar is really thinking about construction projects and redesigning our streets. What is the implementation timeline for that? How long is it gonna to take to get funding, design, and construct those projects? Um, and then how long, typically we add one year to say, it's gonna take about a year to produce results and, and normalize behaviors. So with that in mind, what Dean presented before was the last five years of combined fatal and serious injury crashes. So you can see that again here. The trend line is actually down, which a lot of communities we work in on Vision Zero Action Plans, the trend line is up. So that's a good place to be starting from, for one. So looking out to you know the, what I showed you there, that chart, some of those goals went all the way out to 2050. Um, what the city is committing to is saying we want to reach Vision Zero, Vision Zero by 2039. So that would be 15 years from now. So you can see the trend line there um, headed towards about that same approximate time. Um, and it's not necessarily there's gonna be a straight drop. This is something where you know, it, it might slowly go down, then rapidly go down once some projects are built. And then, like I mentioned with the Ann Arbor example, those last ones are usually pretty hard um, to eliminate. So what that means, Vision Zero 2039, is that we need to achieve 7% less fatal serious and injury crashes on average per year, or eight, eight less of those for the next 15 years, yeah. Uh, so the state of Indiana does not have the best records on data like that. So no, uh, I could potentially find some data that old, um, but it will, yeah, it, and it, they also recently changed how they re use reporting in 2015, or uh, 2016 was the first year. So it would be completely different um, numbers. Uh, they changed how they record serious injuries, for example, um, so. It's a really good point. We did try to look at the last 10 years of data, but because of Ryan's point, we had to only look at the last five years of data because they were different data sets that didn't work nicely together. Yeah, I don't know, Ryan, do you want to talk a little bit about how 2039 was developed, the goal year in the 15 year timeline? Sure, we picked 2039 uh, as an achievable goal. Uh, we didn't want to, we wanted to actually achieve this goal rather than just set a date and hope for the best. So we picked 15 years as a date where we thought we could definitely achieve this uh, given the fact that the numbers change yearly and some things are, uh, temporarily outside of our, our control. So uh, yeah, we picked that as the year that we thought we could actually accomplish this one goal that we set for ourselves. They do include the state trunk lines, the MDOT state trunk lines in the Vision Zero, and that, it, that the high injury network in Ann Arbor, a lot of it is the state trunk lines, and that's how it is in a lot of communities, unfortunately. Um, so a lot of communities are working to devolve their state highways and take back control so that they can design them the way they want so that they're safer. But I can tell you, for, yeah, for that one in particular, I don't know if, uh, and I, I know the city of Denver is as well, that it includes all the CDOT highways, which is pretty much the high injury network is CDOT highways plus some of the other arterials in town. Other folks know about Minneapolis, Chicago, oh. Madison. Or yeah, I know for Minneapolis they do include state highways and they do include county roads as well. So that's a different jurisdiction. We don't have that necessarily layer here, but uh, yeah, the, 
I don't know about all of these examples, but uh, it, the idea is that every roadway within the boundary is analyzed. Uh, like Ryan said, there's some challenges that come with that because the city doesn't have jurisdiction over, say, the bypass around town or something like that. And that's kind of where, like, the, you know, the trend might come down, you know, good initially, but then when we get to those stickier situations where there's more coordination and more design effort and that kind of thing, that's where you might see the, the line flatten a little bit because there's more effort involved there. Yeah. In some communities we do, we haven't done that in Bloomington, but in some places we will. I don't know if, Dean, you wanna take that question or talk about why we didn't in Bloomington? Well, I would say that, you know, looking at the city of Bloomington, just a lot of the context is urban here. So it didn't make a lot of sense to kind of parse out what's urban, what's rural. There are certainly streets in, within the borders that are more rural, and there's kind of a different set of, we'll say, tools in the toolbox to, uh, to uh, kind of implement things on things, or roads that are more rural versus you know, streets that are more urban. And that's certainly things that we'll consider as we move forward with some of these, looking at these corridors specifically. All right, so I'm gonna go back here. Um, anything else, Ryan, you wanna say about goal year? So just as a reminder, that's the, that's the proposed goal year 2039 Vision Zero. Um, as far as next steps, this is just a repeat of that slide you saw at the beginning. So we're kind of right in the middle of the project right now. Like Sarah said, it's an intensive safety week. And from here, we're gonna kind of get all this input and then pick up the pieces and then continue um, developing the project and, and based upon everything that we hear, develop the policy and process changes, the strategies, and come up with the actual action plan. So what are we gonna actually do between now and 2039? So that, that'll be what we're doing for the remainder of the project. Uh, into the summer. And then we'll have another steering committee meeting and there'll be um, e-blasts and social media updates on what else is happening. So that's the end of our presentation. I think we're gonna move just to question, question and answer if anyone has other questions about other topics that they want to ask about. So I'll let R Ryan lead that, I guess, <laughs> if that works. <laughs> or we can all chime in, yeah. Yep, feel free, raise your hand. Yeah. Looks like Ryan's pulling up the list right now. I do have a list. I just sent it since someone else asked. Uh, Kate Rosenbarger, Ann Edmonds, Jacqueline Ray, Jillian Kenzie, Emma Williams, Casey Guerrero, Ben Dalton, Sarah Ryderband, Greg Alexander, and Efret Roser. That, that is the current makeup of the steering committee. I'm so sorry, I missed that. Um, she asked how. Yeah, that's a, a great question. So uh, it will be incorporated in part through this process, uh, just through 
uh, various steps, but uh, more importantly, the ADA transition plan will be uh, incorporated into the comprehensive plan and the transportation plan, um, where they can be more holistically looked at. Um, but yeah, that's coming. That's one of the future updates I mentioned. Actually, the, uh, the, aid, the comprehensive plan portion of that will be at the April meeting of plan commission, so you'll be able to hear about that. Yeah, I would say that is absolutely fair. Um, I don't have anything to add to that. I don't think that is that is what is being done with the, this pr process. I guess I'll just add that you know we look at you know what's going right in places to build what's called a countermeasure toolbox. So like essentially like what are the good good tools that we can use that we see are effective elsewhere, so that we can apply them to other places that are struggling essentially. And so, you know, the tools that are going to slow traffic speed, for instance, so that the kinetic energy is less is like good tools from kind of those like good neighborhood streets that, you know, we can hopefully implement in some of these other places that will, you know, contribute to better safety for everybody on these other streets. So it's kind of a both end. We, yeah, you want to identify the bad and the good so that you can kind of, you know, help the bad become good based on some of the same principles. Even though the context of different streets might look different, so not every tool is applicable in every situation, but uh, that is definitely stuff that we're, yeah, we're trying to look at what, what's succeeding in different places so that we can use that in others. Hope that answered your question. I think Sarah has answered that, or Jazz? Yeah, you, so you can look at it right now and you can see comments that other people have made, right? Yeah, so that's one way that it's public, but then also, yeah, we'll summarize it as part of the action plan and talk, like, discuss how it informed the action plan. So it'd be a summary. Yeah, I mean, I can provide a couple of examples. Maybe other folks can provide examples. Um, so as far as like specifically the implementation grants, I think so. City of Detroit got 35 million, and they identified like 30 corridors and key locations that they just know are crash hotspots and on their high injury network where they're going to install proven safety countermeasures. So do things like put a pedestrian median refuges, um, road diets, narrow the roadway, bulb outs, things like that. Um, improve pedestrian crossings. The other thing I would say is if you're curious about any of those communities, typically they have an annual report that says here's all the things we did last year. So that's the best place I would say you could find it if I can't think of like the best example, but any of those communities that have been doing Vision Zero for a while, they've usually done one, two, three, four or more annual reports. You can see like all the things that they constructed and, and all the non-infrastructure things too. So like all the speed enforcement type things that they've done, education, that kind of thing. Anything else that? Um, in some communities it might have gone to automated enforcement. Yeah, some communities use automated enforcement. But implementation grants, I don't think, can be used for enforcement. It's for construction projects, right? Yeah, I don't think that they can be used for that kind of thing. I think it's more proverbially and literally concrete uh, uh, 
things in the ground. Um, some of the demonstration projects might apply for uh, that kind of stuff. I know like other communities sometimes they'll like purchase more like speed trailers that they can, you know, put on the side of the road that flashes your speed as whatever. It's not enforcement, it's more like passive enforcement, so to speak. Um, uh, I, don't, I haven't heard of really any communities actually like hiring police officers with this money. I don't think that's allowed, if that makes sense. One thing I'll just say is uh, what Dean mentioned, the proven safety countermeasures have something called a crash modification factor. So it's like a study of nationwide where this thing has been implemented, what percent reduction in this type of crash could we expect if we installed that in our community? So that's definitely part of how it's informed. Ryan, I don't know if you'll... Yeah, I was going to say that that's the same thing. And then the engineering department, not to put them on the spot, uh, looks at that data and uh, past data and expected outcome and tries to make the best decision we can. So oftentimes it looks like the same result, uh, but that's just because that's the one that works and we know that it is working. And then we go back and we study and make sure that it was providing the results we think it, think it was. And then, of course, that leads to us doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah, we definitely look at that. I don't know about the B line, but for instance, the seven line, we've done, uh, we've looked at that, um, and we saw that the, some of the intersections had an increased rate of crashes, um, and so we try to address that when we can. Absolutely. Uh, that is something we're studying. Part of the reason it's temporary material, as you mentioned, uh, is where it's an implementation. We're studying it to see what happens uh, when we do that small change. Uh, so yeah, the, we expected uh, a portion of this, I'll be honest, because you're right, uh, people were stopping in the bike lane to let their Uber drop-offs happen. Um, so we expected a little bit of that. We thought maybe they would adjust, but we're going to study that and come back with an answer of what we propose to the fix is for that, if anything. So, yeah, it's we just keep studying it is the answer. Yeah. I mean, the bus stop
I guess I would start by saying this isn't a direct calculation. It's more of an ambitious goal of saying this is what we, th this is what we think the goal should be. We think in 15 years we can get to zero. We know this line is not going to be straight. It's going to be a squiggly line. Um, I wouldn't say we're factoring in work from home and reduced traffic volumes because it has more to do with the infrastructure of the streets in the first place. So a reduction in the number of people being out and about walking, biking, driving might reduce the crash rate. But when our goal is zero, it doesn't necessarily matter. We still have to make the whole system safe, I guess. Yeah, and, and, you know, we may have your car number, but we may have one True. Pulling a wagon or whatever. True. Yeah. I get it. Thanks for the question. When you have the kinetic energy uh, inhibition, I, I think of myself as one of those things that therefore would change the kinetic energy after someone hits me, which frequently happens downtown, people trying to. I would say the number one thing is to reduce speeds. I mean, that the whole focus of Vision Zero and safety planning is just reduce speeds. It's it's both. So the, reducing speeds is the primary thing, but it's also designing a more forgiving system. I guess is the best way I can put it. I'll put the engineer yeah. on the spot. <laughs> uh, I would say that yeah, uh, kind of the that slide that was like don't control speeds do the kinetic energy. I think maybe the message for that topic is like, we've been so focused on controlling speeds, it's just one part of the overall kinetic energy picture, right? So we still need to control speeds. It's still the, you know, the graph that was up about, you know, when people get hit as they're walking and what speed, like that says a lot of information right there. So. I, it's, it's kind of like a yes, control speeds, but also like Drew was saying, you know, design your places so that they are forgivable, so that if somebody does make an error, they're not careening off the road into somebody who's walking. Like there is some some like barriers that are there, you know, whether physical or you know, what type of barriers those might be. You know, that's a question. Um, you know, uh, there's there's some people that advocate for you know, installing lots of bollards uh, along streets to keep cars from getting into the pedestrian realm. Street trees might be another, you know, we don't want to like necessarily use all that stuff as like guardrails necessarily, but like those are some things, strategic placement of certain features to keep that interaction. You know, kind of going back to the safe systems approach, one of the pieces of the pie is separating users in space and time. And so separating them in space means that vehicles and people who are walking or biking, like there's a, a physical separation there so that there isn't that opportunity to have a, a serious injury or fatality. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I have a renewed appreciation for riding on staff. We have a horse and buggy town for 100 years. And we put through ways to it. So when you showed where the major uh, fatality and serious in injuries were, I don't think any of us have lived here for a while. We could have, you could have paid us 20 bucks, we could have told you most of it. But we turned five or six, I, I could name them before they came up, the throughways. And it seems to me that uh, we've got to do something about speed. But I'm wondering what more. Why people are bikes on the sidewalk. Um, 
seems to me we've got a horse and buggy uh, situation and we're trying to find a solution to get us to the 21st century. I think you make a lot of great points. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, uh, lots of things are working, lots of things aren't working. Um, it, uh, to answer some of your questions, one of the things that we would like to look at doing more often is separating roadway users to talk about how uh, sometimes bikes are on sidewalks and that's a problem for both bikes and pedestrians. Uh, so that's a thing we would like to consider doing more when we can, um, things like that. Uh, yeah, each corridor takes its own, has its own little answer and we just have to uh, use this approach to figure out what that is. For civ civility, that one's trickier. Can't probably address that in this document, but um, if we could, I would. Yeah, so uh, interestingly, we started this probably in the wrong order, but we it doesn't actually matter because uh, to the point just made, we could have named the top 10 uh, worst corridors. Uh, anyone on the street could have who's lived here for more than five years. So uh, we came in knowing that College and Walnut would be high on this list. Uh, so it got called out in the 2019 plan, uh, transportation plan as a corridor that we should study. And then uh, because we knew that it had uh, a, a long history of uh, serious, in, serious injuries and fatalities, it also had a long history of other issues, speeding, um, just regular congestion, et cetera. So um, yeah, we, if we would have started this first, we still would have done College and Walnut as, uh, as the project we knew was something we needed to study as it, on its own, so um, yeah. So uh, I'll take a crack at this and then let, the, let the professionals answer. But um, two things, one, areas that feel unsafe are often inadvertently safer. So a good example of that is 10th Street feels unsafe because uh, there are a lot of pedestrians crossing around Fee Lane. Uh, it, it comes up a lot on the survey, for in instance, but it is relatively low on the crash. Uh, it's on the, the list, but it is lower than other areas, which uh, College and Walnut has a lot of incidences of um, people claiming that they feel unsafe, identifying that they feel unsafe along College and Walnut, but uh, for that one intersection at 10th and Fee, we can see that it's a lot higher, but that the actual number of serious injuries and fatalities there is a lot lower. Um, so that is an, an interesting aspect. So it, I think the answer is that you have to look at both. Uh, in order to determine uh, how to make it mesh. It's, it's not uh, a direct one-for-one -one comparison. So one thing, um, have folks here in the room taken a look at the engagement map at all? Have everybody's been on it? So it actually lines up pretty well 
with the high injury network, actually surprisingly so, I feel like compared to a lot of places. But one of the things that we really look for in the map that we can't see in the crash data are near misses. And I feel like we've all had, hopefully, a lot more near misses than crashes, but we've probably all experienced near misses. And those aren't gonna come up in the crash data, but those are going to impact people's feelings of how safe they feel at a location. And so when we look at engagement, um, that's a lot of what we're looking at, is like, where are the crashes almost happening? Because we also know that if that behavior is almost happening, so if you're a driver and you're thinking about, oh, maybe I should, maybe I should bike, but you have a near miss incident someplace, you're like, I am never biking through that location, right? So it, these experiences really impact your choices down the line. So even if that crash data doesn't show up, it's still really important to learn about those locations throughout the engagement process so we can address that. And in the engagement map that we had, when you put down a point, you then described a little bit about why you put down the point and whether or not there was a near miss. So we can extract a little bit more information than just a point. Um, and then to your other very true statement about how the folks that go to this map are self-selected, like 100%. Um, and that's actually why we're doing this safety week, because we're hoping to get not self-selected people this week to help balance it out. And we're asking a lot of those same questions. We'll be having a map exercise at the engagement event so people can write on a map at the things where their points are. And we'll be looking to see if what people are writing down at these not self-selected events are the same as what we've heard on the map, or if there's some discrepancies that we should think about as we're hopefully reaching a really broad, uh, diverse population this week. One thing I'll, oh yeah. No, I was just gonna say one more thing that, like something that's really interesting to me is finding out from the people like where do you avoid and where are there barriers? Because that's not gonna show up in a, looking backwards crash data, that's where we really need to hear from everybody to like add to the crash data to get that full picture and that's what's really important. And it really we can't get that until we're here talking to a representative population, which it kind of all comes together in that. So, yeah, go ahead. So I have a <coughs> concern about our choice to use an ill-defined word like unsafe, um, which is, I mean, we, we should be choosing our phrases more carefully. And as an example, take East Third Street. Um, in that, determined that speed, uh, traffic had fallen from 18,000 to 12,000 cars per day, and so they downsized it to uh, one lane east of the mall to one lane each way, turn lane, and then they put in uh, bike lanes. But bike lanes, of course, are just pain. And when I asked about the prospect of, say, making it like a boulevard, where there are trees lining it, INDOT's reaction was trees would be unsafe because it'd be unsafe for cars to steer out of control. Okay, so in other words, can we, can in your report, in the work you're doing, can you avoid using an un, uh, unmodified term like unsafe in favor of unsafe to pedestrians for cars to go fast? Yeah. Uh, it's an awkward term, but do you see the difference? And is that something that, uh, can be incorporated into your work. Absolutely. <laughs> I will say that, uh, you know, a certain roadway context may be unsafe for certain users and more safe for others. So that's kind of a distinction, the nuance. We don't want to, yeah, there's definitely a lot of nuance in that. And, and yep. the things I've heard of people talking about safety, and as you yourself have pointed out, it's in the eye of the holder unless we're more precise about sure. it. I mean, uh, uh, this gentleman here mentioned uh, uh, the advent of Uber's now stopping in a lane on these search sheets out of the campus. But I mean, if there is a block of the city that has been uh, brought up as an example more people than anyone about block lanes, it's Walton Street between six and seven, where the beer trucks are unloading on both sides a three-lane, one-way street, and only one lane's available. And I've never heard the other people grousing about beer 
carrier trucks. And then I looked it up and found that the city code says as long as one lane's open, maybe it's statute, I don't know. As long as one lane's open, uh, then it's legal. And it also serves to slow traffic. So, I mean, what should our high priority the ongoing flow of traffic or the speed? I think you can have both. I mean, headway varies as the square of the, dis of the speed. So, like, you need geometrically more space to slow down than a fire to have faster speed. It's in our interest to slow traffic down. The Ubers are fine if they slow traffic. Third Street and Atwater, there are people going at 40 miles an hour on those streets. There's no excuse for it. So anything that will slow traffic down, like Uber, I mean, please leave the temporary bike lanes in and let the Uber stop in one lane and make the cars slow down. Not even that. Yeah, I wasn't really saying that uh, I didn't think it was a good idea to just slow traffic. Okay, fine to slow traffic. My problem with it is, is people cutting out to go around these vehicles. That's my problem. Why? Because they'll do it in the same manner, and there will be the same amount of traffic using one lane as what we used to, and they'll do it in the same manner. There are going to be accidents. And that's a reason to take out the bike lane? No, the bike lane was already there. No, no, I'm talking about the protected part of the bike lane. Okay, the protected part. The yeah. bike lane was already there. Yeah, I, I will, I'll, I'll challenge you on that. I'd rather have a protected bike lane and, and uh, find other ways to slow traffic down. Can I ask you a question? I think it's interesting that Mr. Uh, Roland mentioned about unsafe. In the context of this plan, it's zero fatalities and serious injuries. Like that's the ultimate goal, and that's where the buck stops. So there, there are stories and that could be told there in different ways of kind of breaking that down. But the whole point of Vision Zero is it's a really easy goal to communicate and say when we say we want our streets to be safe, we mean we don't want people to die or get seriously injured just because they're going from point A to point B. That's what I think. Absolutely, lots of communities have. Even in the United States now, a couple of communities have. Like Jersey City most recently did, Hoboken. Boulder is very close. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I, I don't think we would see it as a fault of the transportation system if it was a, like an act of God or something.
you want to start with that one, Dean, about how we're looking at different modes? Yeah, well, uh, Drew, I suppose you could probably bring up those pie charts or whatever, too. Um, <clears throat> so we have looked at kind of, you know, definitely vehicle, uh, vehicle on vehicle crashes are a big part of this, especially considering that that's the majority of the modes of transportation in town, right? So we need to definitely be considering that. And so there are definitely countermeasures we're looking at to reduce that uh, type of crash as well. Um, we don't want to propose these countermeasures though that are going to help just vehicle crashes, but then also hurt like other mode crashes, if that makes sense. So, you know, one example of that might be like, if you add a turn lane somewhere that might reduce the amount of vehicle crashes, but it also lengthens by, you know, X number of feet, the conflict that somebody crossing the street on foot is gonna have with that vehicle. So like, yes, definitely we need to, need to and will be looking at vehicle uh, related crashes as a big part of this as well. But just holistically though, we need to look at all the modes at the same time, yep. Yeah, so it's on that slide right there. So the on the far right there, you see the total number of crashes. Uh, the ones that are just coded to vehicle are vehicle to vehicle crashes. And then the ones that are coded to pedestrian would be vehicle pedestrian crashes. So if that, if that helps to answer that question. Uh, and you can look at to the, the fatal crashes and the incapacitating injury crashes as well. Um, the, in that top column would be the vehicle to vehicle, uh, or yeah, top row, excuse me, would be the vehicle to vehicle crashes. Just chime in and say that you know, say like. I'm not going to be safe if I don't get over there. Okay. We also know that crashes that occur with people who are walking, biking, or a combination thereof are often underreported or unreported as well. And so there's that going on, but there's. There's also kind of the kinetic energy component of this too, that like a bike is only gonna travel at up to say 15 miles per hour or something like that. And even if they, well, it may be more than that, but not, not, not. Yeah, 
but okay. But my point is that they're not getting to the the same speed as say, somebody driving is probably going to be, right? And so that's where we see that, like you know, even if a bicyclist hits somebody who's walking, because of that, you know, kinetic energy differential compared to say a vehicle, and also talking about the weight that's behind, you know, kind of that momentum. It's mass times velocity is uh, is momentum. A hundred uh, times more weight a car, right, than a bicycle. Yeah. It's a factor of a hundred. So not to say that bicycle on people walking crashes are not a concern. It's just that we, because of those laws of physics, it usually is the vehicles that are we're more concerned about just because there's more of that potential for problems, if that makes sense. Yep. I think that's a very valid point. We should update that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> there are some that are not vehicle vehicle disorders. Uh, so just oh. point of clarification. Yes. It's vehicle only. only. Yeah. 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 Single um, vehicle crash. Right. Switching gears and that actually is just not getting to talk about it. I think I saw it in your slides about what other teammates mentioned zero goals are. And part of it was maybe about kind of getting into the civilian. Um, I guess I would be really interested in better understanding what other communities do to address the culture and how effective it is and what, what can we do, especially in like school zones, to get people to obey the 20 mile an hour flashing speed thing, or, or to understand that maybe some additional play will be split to culture as a real purpose. So just wanting to get deeper on that. It's a nice way of putting it. I think, yeah, for the action plan, there will be, you know, educational and informational strategies too. So it's not the only thing. Did you have something to add, Sarah? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, like you said. You know, engineering can only do so much. There's a cultural component of it. And I think, you know, it, it's interesting thinking about the purpose of this plan, that we're really talking about serious injuries and fatalities. And if we're looking to reduce it, as we've talked about before, the key thing is to reduce speed of vehicles. If we, like, made vehicles crawl along, this probably wouldn't be a problem at all. But we have these underlying assumptions about how we've always historically operated vehicles, how we can get from one side of the town to the other in 10 minutes, like those sorts of parts of how we live our daily lives um, is just what we're used to. And a lot of transitioning from 
you know, a, a less safe society to a more safe society on our streets is making the community feel like going slow is worth it. Right, And so to understand, yes, I do need to go 15 through the school zone, and I'm not just swearing my whole way through because I need to get to work faster. right? And so those are the culture changes that need to happen. And these culture changes are not easy. Um, I wouldn't say there have been like all like, you know, heaven's raised success stories on this sort of thing, but in, policy, you know, in documents like this, there's policy, programmatic, and engineering. So there's a whole spectrum of recommendations that come in. And so we have done communications and education campaigns both at the school-wide level and at the community-wide level to try to hit the, you know, the hearts and mind pieces. But what we've really found is that you can't, you know, just do the hearts and minds without the education or with that, and without the engineering, like it has to come from all sides. And so I think that, you know, that culture shift is something that, that we aim for. Um, but a lot of times it takes a while for those engineering things to become normalized a bit. And for, you know, 10, 10 years of those buffered bike lanes to come in to be like, this, like, this is just how it is. Like, this is just how we operate. And so, so some of it takes time, um, which I think goes into how the goals were set, that I would say, you know, Bloomington has taken a very smart tactic of not being overly ambitious. So there is that time to allow the infrastructure to do its thing and to allow culture to change. But I think there are some kind of programmatic educational components that should be applied as well. I just wanted to touch on something kind of tangentially brought up to that, you know, we need to also consider like land use and where people are trying to kind of go to and from a bit in this as well. And if there's, not that we're gonna, you know, analyze the city's land use necessarily fully like with this project, but like land use and transportation go together very, you know, hand in hand, so to speak. And, you know, if somebody has to go all the way across town to get to a, you know, a service or something like that, rather than like, you know, being two blocks away that they could walk to or something like that. That's, a, you know, that's putting them in a vehicle when, you know, maybe if it was closer, they could walk or bike there. And then we have a difference of, we've reduced the kinetic energy because they're not in a vehicle anymore. You know, so we're not gonna, you know, solve all the problems, you know, that may be inherent in, you know, the, the land use and the built environment here. But that is also something with this type of plan that will kind of identify like, hey, you know, there are some, you know, contexts that we're seeing, you know, through this community, like our, our areas that are kind of like, well, I was going to pick on the strip mall, like right now, like, are those showing up more often, you know, because people have to drive there and it's a much, the larger streets are there and that kind of thing, whether, you know, if, if everything is a little bit more closer, that people would have another mode of transportation to get there. Would that also help to contribute towards getting to zero uh, fatal and serious injuries? So these are all like it's not just a one size fits all thing. There's a lot going on there too. So um, I just want to say I know uh, people probably have to get to dinner <laughs> here pretty soon. Uh, thank you everybody for for coming tonight. We'll be sticking around for a few more minutes if in case anybody wants to. Uh, continue to chat with us about these things. I just wanted to say thank you and uh, realize that we're long past time because that's a, <laughs> it's a great conversation to have, so. Uh. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming, everybody. No, thank you. <laughs>